is asleep uh, but awakened about noon by her lap dog shock before she awakens she dreams about a uh, ariel ariel as you know is a rosicrucian self i'll tell you uh, about rosicrucian philosophy just now after that who whispers praises in her ear and wants her to be aware of uh, some people especially men when she does awaken she finds a love letter uh, on her bed and when she reads that love letter she quickly forgets all the advice that ariel has given her in the dream she has been invited to sail up the uh, the teams with friends to hampton court palace this place i think you should remember hampton court palace and have fun and games with her you know host she devotes much time to her cosmetics and hair in preparation for the trip uh this you have seen in canto 1 now uh this poem uh you have you know the presence of you know selps so i would like to tell you in this context that pope had hit upon a curious french book and this is comte d gabales this is a french book which professes to reveal the mysteries of rosi crucian crucian yeah, this is uh, ru sien now who are the rosi crucians members of an order devoted to occult lore occult lore founded in 1484 by rogen kris and it occurred to him that the elemental silps and gnomes would serve his purpose admirably and you know uh, as you know that when this supernatural machinery was introduced the rape of the lock appeared in its new form with silps and gnomes and all that now uh, in the opening part of canto 2 we find find out the picture of belinda how beautiful she is radiant brilliant belinda she sets off for hampton court palace traveling by boat on the river thames a group of fashionable ladies and gentlemen accompanies her she was looking so beautiful that pope says that every eye was fixed on her alone she was extremely beautiful and pope says that her lovely looks and quick eyes command the attention and adoration of those who see her bel you know whatever uh, uh item she wore everything was adding the beauty to belinda belinda's glittering raiment includes 
a sparkling cross which she wears on her white breast inspiring the worship of her admirers and we have a line of a couplet regarding this and the line is on her white breast a sparkling cross she wore her most striking attribute is uh this is the a line two locks which graceful hung this is her mo uh, her uh, most striking attribute these two locks which graceful hung in ringlets he says on her ivory neck whatever uh, i am just writing within what they call lines from the poem so she was extremely beautiful and those two locks which graceful hung in ringlets in circles on her neck which was extremely white ivory neck pope beautifully describes these curls these ringlets as labyrinth maze which is called bhul bhulaiya because if you come if you just look at them you will i mean uh, uh, just you will invite uh, the destruction because you will be imprisoned if you look at them you will be imprisoned in the net of those you know uh, uh, hair now so uh, here we have how uh, uh, pope describes the beauty of you know uh, belinda you know sparkling cross two locks and uh, all that the lovers actually they are described as devotees one of the devotees the baron greatly admires her ringlets those locks of hair and has decided to steal them for himself he was so much attracted by those locks of hair that he dis- he 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 has decided that i w- that he would steal them and then there is a line by force or by fraud he wants to get them by fair means or foul means on this particular morning he rose early to build and altar to love at which to pray for success in this venture this is actually the epical convention which pope is using here he is going for the <laughs> it seems to us he is going for the uh, battlefield actually and that for he is performing some kind of puja he created a pyre and on it sacrificed all the trophies of his former loves fanning the flames with three amorous sighs three amorous sighs three magical number he burnt three garters half a pair of gloves and tender bile do love letters he sacrificed everything at the altar of love 
forgot all the previous loves because he is going to get the new love now the powers heard his prayer and chose to grant half of it whatever puja and worship he performed his wish was granted but only half of it he will get you just uh, uh, i mean uh, pay your attention to it half of it was granted as the boat makes its way to hampton court belinda and her companions enjoy a light hearted journey now ariel as i told you in the very beginning is very anxious very worried because he is rem- remembering the foretold impending woe that some kind of woe some kind of sorrow is going to happen something which actually he is not uh, able to recognize the exact nature of that uh, uh, event but something is going to happen concerned for belinda's safety he summons an army of sylphs to protect her the sprites assemble their bodies are glittering in the sunlight ariel addresses them much the same as a general you know addresses his troops uh you'll find out you know a kind of epical you know preparation is there he reminds them of their duties that your duty is to look after the fair 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 mean fair sex that is women as part of their responsibilities to the women the sprites protect ladies you know everything related to their cosmetics and all that like you know powders perfumes curls cosmetics these are actually the lines which are used in the poem so it is their duty to look after uh the fair that is you know the fair sex and because some dire disaster looms over belinda ariel gives responsibility to some specific sylphs to look after these items seriously for example he gives the responsibility to one self who is called zephyreta zephy this is uh uh gives the responsibility to one self whose name is zephy rate and the responsibility was that the self will take care of belinda's fan then another self named blint was given the responsibility of protecting her ear rings another self called momentila it was given the responsibility to protect her watch and crispissa the most important work that is locks of hair and ariel will look after shock that is her lap dog so these are the responsibilities which were assigned to them 
Now, above all, Ariel is concerned uh, that someone might, and then there is a line, stain her honor. That is something which is very important. Somebody will attack her virginity. Therefore, he chooses 50 select silks to guard her petticoat. Ariel wants that any sprite who neglects his duties shall feel sharp vengeance. I will not leave you. You have to perform your duty seriously. Now the silps report to their posts and wait for the birth of fate. That what is, you know, uh, going to happen. Now this here, you know, Canto 2 uh, ends. What happens in Canto 3? After the cruise on the Thames, we find Belinda, the Baron, and the rest of the party arriving at the palace, Hampton Court Palace. There, Belinda decides to play a Spanish card game, Omber. Omber is Spanish card game, with two of her suitors. During the game, coffee was served. Coffee, which was recently introduced into England by Queen Anne. And we have the reference of the coffee houses in 18th century. Coffee, which was recently introduced into England by Queen Anne in order to help with the alcohol problem. And when it was served, the fumes from the hot liquid opened the rational mind of the baron, giving him another strategy. With the help of a woman named Clarissa, Clarissa, He manages to cut off the lock of hair during the card game. So, Canto 3 is very important. Here takes place the cutting of the lock of Belinda's hair when the card game was going. Now, the cutting, it was not basically the cutting of a lock of hair. It was the outraging of the chastity of a woman. So, at this rape, it, it, it's rape. Belinda cries out in horror. And on the one hand, we have Belinda crying out in horror. And on the other hand, Baron is crying out in triumph. Oh, oh I have won, I have won. I have cut off the lock of hair. And we have the third person that is Ariel. Ariel is weeping bitterly because he was not able to prevent the deed. He said, what is this happening? What has happened? I could not protect Belinda's lock of hair. So, Canto 3 is significant that way because here, cutting of the lock of hair takes place and that, uh, that event, which is, which, uh, is the base of the poem, the rape of the lock. Uh, as you know that uh, the theme is very trivial. But the treatment is very grandiloquent. In order to you know make the poem look like an epic. And you will find out that you know Baron performing some kind of worship at altar is also an epic device. Belinda preparing herself to attend the party is also an epic device. And Ariel addressing the other silps is also uh, an epic device. 
so but you know all these epical devices used by the poet for the trivial subject matter is what makes the poem the great example of mock epic now coming to canto 4 canto 4 now belinda is already very disturbed she is crying out in horror that my lock of hair is cut there is a bad self in the poem called umbrail uh it takes to it takes advantage of that chaos and chooses to increase the sorrows by flying down to the cave of spleen we have the reference of this this again is an epical device to get more woes and sorrows to dump onto belinda he enters and secures from the queen of spleen a bag of horrible noises and while of tears sorrows and griefs in order to increase the woes of belinda one of belinda's friends named thales tris demonstrates fair weather friendship when she announces that everyone is talking about the rape of the lock and that she is upset that she will also be branded as loose because i am her friend she is raped so i'll be also clubbed with belinda thalestris attempts to get her brother sir plume to demand that the lock be returned so that things will be settled i will also be safe but sir plume is unsuccessful he was not able to get the lock of hair back now in uh, canto 5 it shows that how umbrail this character umbrail is casting the you know vial of woes upon belinda so that she is almost drawn in tears she is longing for simple life now clarissa whose reference i have already given you who gave that caesar to uh, baron to cut the lock of the hair uh gives an interesting moral sermon here about vanity and age and the need of women to use good sense in the battle of the sexes soon a battle of tea cups battle of tea cups start disturbed by the baron's sneezing from the snuff that he is using and this causes the lock to fly high onto the air the lock which he was uh, having in his you know hand it flew high into the air never to be rescued lock has disappeared some think that the lock has gone to the moon where you know love letters and other love tokens find themselves eventually but others think that the lock became a star so here ends the poem the poem as i have told you in the beginning is a beautiful example of burlesque it takes trivial subjects and treats them seriously in order to create some ludicrous effect we have some important themes which are uh, used by the poet here 
Now we, uh, if we talk about some important themes, then we have the theme of manners. Uh, as you know that, you know, we have the irony in the poem. The irony of tone with which Pope presents the ridiculousness of posing the more significant and important issues beside the more trivial and insignificant makes for a sharp perceptive satire. The poem describes the manners of the time, the artificiality of the time. Then we have the theme of triviality. We have the theme of human vanity. We have the theme of female sexuality. We have the theme of heroism and counter heroism. We have the theme of piety and we have the theme of idleness. These are because you know you'll find out that rape of the lock displays the idleness and foolishness of the upper you know classes and contemporary society of the time. And whatever he does actually, he does with the beautiful effect of social satire. And the poem, as you know, is an example of social satire. And this he does with the help of the mock epic device. It's a satire on the aristocratic ladies of the 18th century. It exposes to ridicule their laziness, idleness, frivolities, vanities, follies, shams, shallowness. Superficiality, prudery, hypocrisy, uh, self embellishment, excessive use of you know uh, uh, um, uh, toilet that is you know. Uh, cosmetics and all and high matrimonial aspirations so and you have seen in the case of you know, Belinda how lazy idle frivolous she is she gets up 12 in the noon and when she was being awakened by uh, her lap dog and the very opening lines of the poem you have already seen how satire is used. When the I have already given you the reference of those lines. Is in task so bold can little men engage, and in soft bosoms dwell such mighty rays. Look at the lines task so bold and little men, and soft bosoms and mighty rays. And as I told you, that the poet mocks at the late rising of the aristocratic ladies and gentlemen of the time. Belinda gets up at 12. And the line is, the couplet is, Now lap dogs give themselves the rousing shake. Belinda was awakened by shock. And sleepless lovers just at 12 awake. Now the aristocratic ladies of those days were over fond of, you know, gilded chariot and of the games like Omber. And the poet makes fun of their that over fondness here. And you'll find out how, you know, Belinda goes for that game. The love letters which these ladies received were a source of much pleasure to them. 
the poet makes fun of belinda by saying that when at last she woke up from her prolonged sleep her eyes first opened on a love letter in which the lover had spoken of wounds charms and ardor uh the poet is you know not merely laughing at belinda but also at conventional vocabulary of those love letters whatever you know items uh they are using uh you'll have you know satire uh in some prominent lines in most of the lines but you know there is a couplet uh where you know we have the juxtaposition of you know uh, uh, you know important matters and trivial matters and the line is here thou great anna here thou great anna queen and whom three realms obey dost sometimes counsel take and sometimes tea and this is the beautiful example of bethos from high to low here thou great anna whom three realms obey dost sometimes counsel take and sometimes tea example of bethos satire is there to the ladies of the time their domestic pets were as important as their husbands they showed in them a superficiality of mind and a lack of any depth of feeling which the poet has admirably satirized and i would like to tell you the lines look at the lines the beautiful example of satire not louder shrieks to pitying heaven are cast not louder shrieks to pitying heaven are cast when husbands or when lap dogs breathe their last when husbands or when lap dogs breathe their last so uh husbands and lap dogs the same thing is there so you'll find out uh, how beautifully the poem has taken the trivial subject and treated it in a very grand manner and the poem becomes a beautiful example of you know mock epic social satire it beautifully reflects the 18th century Uh, society and as i told you that when it was first published in 1712 it was only in two cantos but later on it was you know uh, revised and it was published with you know five cantos uh the poem uh, is the best example of poetic diction and if you want to see the ornamental language of the 18th century just read this poem poetic diction when we use the word poetic diction it means highly ornamental and embellished language we have beautiful you know figures of speech if you want to study figures of speech you will just you know uh, read this poem we have personifications we have you know anaphora we have alliteration we have uh, sylipses we have zeugma i mean all these figures of speech uh, you know are used in this poem and i would just you know uh, planning ones uh, to teach or uh, to record my uh, lecture on uh, this poem uh, on on figures of speech so i thought that why not uh, you know give the reference of this poem if you uh, read this poem then i think you will be able to understand most of those figures of speech which you uh, have not heard like for example we have uh, 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 figures of speech like anaphora sylipses zeugma even you have the figure of speech like you know uh, we have use of hyperbole also in uh, this poem because uh, uh, most of the time exaggeration is you know uh, taking place in the poem so uh, uh, 
as you know that when Wordsworth wrote preface to the lyrical ballads, he attacked on the poetic diction of 18th century. And these, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the figures of speech which you are studying, that will also, you know, help you in future. So this is all about uh, the poem. Thank you very much.